so colleagues, uh, welcome back uh, to our school for young scientists. Um, uh, so we have uh, last but not least, of course, lecture of today from Professor Jeff McDonald. Thank you for connecting from Canada at such an early hour in Saskatchewan. So several words uh, about Professor McDonald. He is a professor of hydrology and associate director of the Global Institute for Water Security at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, he is the recipient of a number of uh, prizes uh, from uh, uh, AGU and EGU, and uh, uh, he, is a co he is an author of several books, and he is a member of various uh, committees. He is a, a, a devoted uh, hydrologist, very well known uh, around the world. And uh, the rest will be in his uh, presentation. So, Professor McDonald, the floor is yours. Great. So, 45 minutes lecture and 15 okay. minutes for questions. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll try and share my screen here. All right. Can you see that? Okay, uh, Dimitri? Yes. Yes. Now okay. we can see. Yes. Good. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And it's an honor to participate in this class. And it's especially nice to interact with PhD students and postdocs. And that's something that uh, we do here a lot at our Global Institute for Water Security. My title has changed a little bit. When I saw the final program, I wanted to connect my talk perhaps a little bit more to other things that you've heard. So we will still talk about developing uh, perceptual model and numerical watershed modeling, but I'd like to talk about it in the context of new research that relates to the water balance, hydrology's most basic equation. And this is what I'll talk about for the next 45 minutes. This paper came out a couple of years ago. Uh, you can find it on my webpage. It's a small commentary, but it kind of uh, captures the essence of this talk. And the, the conclusion of this talk I'll give at the very beginning is that this terrestrial water cycle that we all know and love is usually assessed at the annual time scale. We, we close the water balance at the annual time step. But most of the water that makes up the water balance can be very old and at time scales much longer than one year. And that's what I want to talk about today. Maybe a new look at the water balance based on what tracer information is suggesting. So we'll start with a little bit of background on the water balance equation. Uh, we'll talk then about how geology and biology affect uh, stream flow and influence the water balance. And then maybe some new ways to come at the terrestrial water cycle from a numerical modeling uh, point of view. And again, I'm hoping to maybe tie to some themes that you've had uh, already through the week. Now, we're going to, you saw the photo here. I'm in the headwaters of the Seine River in France. Uh, this is the same river, of course, that flows through Paris. Some of you might have sipped a, a, a coffee on the left bank at some point. Here we're up in the very headwaters of that catchment. And the reason why we're up in those headwaters is that that's where the first water balance measurements were made by Pierre Perrault in 1674. Some of you might know this book. It's a prized possession of mine on my bookshelf behind me. But this was the first measurements of rainfall that he made in Dijon, not so far from the catchment outlet. And then measurements of flow in the stream in this 140 square kilometer catchment uh, shown here, where he made measurements of the watershed area based on uh, walking the catchment and calculating the area. And this is what the stream looks like today. It's, it's lovely uh, farmland and it's a very small stream channel. But importantly, what he showed for the first time with measurements, and here's me taking a stream sample. We're doing some uh, tritium analysis of these same waters uh, for reasons that will be more obvious at the end of the talk. The important thing from Perot's work was that for the first time he showed with measurements that input was more than output in terms of precipitation, there was more precipitation than stream flow on an annual basis. And therefore it put to rest many 
uh, wild theories of the water cycle and linked it more to inputs minus outputs equals change in storage and the things we know today. So you all know the wa annual water balance, uh, change in storage with time equals inputs minus outputs. We can write this in many ways that are fancier and more complex, but essentially this is what we've been doing now for a couple of hundred years. It wasn't until uh, um, Dalton in the UK in the early 1800s made many more extensive measurements that this became really solidified in our science. But I would say what we've been doing now since the early 1800s around the world is measuring the same things in increasing detail. So now rather than throwing some straw into the stream and computing discharge linked to wetted area, now we have gauging stations like this one, we have recording rain gauges, and of course we look at the watershed or catchment rainfall runoff in this way. So here is a very familiar rainfall runoff uh, series. This is from a small headwater catchment in uh, Southeast Alaska where I've been working. On the y-axis is runoff, on the x-axis is time, and we look at the inputs as you see in the rain hyetograph and the outputs in the form of stream flow to understand how water is moving through our systems and quantifying these key water balance components. And you've seen this time and time again, I'm sure, in your studies, uh, looking at how rain impulses affect the stream flow and how we might model that. The key thing though I want to talk about today is that what is this signal? This signal is the celerity of the hydraulic potentials moving through the landscape. In other words, this is a pressure wave response to that rainfall input. This maybe is a, a, an analogy that might help. This is like a full garden hose on the lawn in your parents' house somewhere. You lift up the end of the hose, what happens? Water immediately comes out. And that's the translation of the hydraulic potential through the hose, the celerity, the wave speed. That's what I want you to think about when you see the rainfall runoff hydrograph. Now, what I want to contrast that with is what we can see with tracers. And in particular today, we're gonna to trace the water balance using the stable isotopes of hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, these are the things, of course, that make up the water molecule. And these are like fingerprints of the water cycle. So on the left, you see the water cycle. On the right, you see the actually the isotope signature for different parts of the water cycle that we can now easily collect and analyze, not just the liquid, but also the vapor. So this gives us a way to now actually track the raindrops in our catchments using naturally occurring stable isotopes. And if we look now at our catchment and we look at input and output, but this time not rainfall and runoff, but is what is carried with the rain or snow melt and what is carried with the stream flow, this is now another way of looking at the system. And this in fact interrogates the left-hand side of the equation. This is telling us something about storage change with time because on the left-hand side now you see about seven years of rainfall or precipitation input. And the right side is a very lagged and damped version of that input. And that's because most of the water goes into the catchment and the catchment acts as a filter for that input uh, and, and in terms of what we see in the stream. And importantly, rather than the celerity of the hydraulic potential, these are measuring the velocity of the water molecule. This is a very different information source that I think can be helpful in understanding and modeling our systems, per, especially in response to changing climate, non-stationarity, and some of the other things you've heard of this week. So what I mean by velocity versus celerity, the stream flow response is like lifting the hose. The isotope response is like taking that hose on a hot summer day, connecting it to the the water tap on the side of the house, turning that on. Again, water immediately comes out the end of the hose, but it might take 
many minutes for that cool water from the house to be felt at the end of the hose. This is the difference that I'm talking about between velocity and celerity, and celerity is much, much, much greater usually than velocity. Let's look at an extreme example. Here we've taken a, a device into the field, this black box to a small watershed in Oregon in the United States, and we're gonna measure in high frequency the, ra the rainfall and runoff. So look at the top uh, piece of this diagram. The black is the rain input, the red line is the stream hydrograph that you know. And on the x-axis, it's about three days. The lower two panels, one is for deuterium, one is for O18. These are the isotopes of the, the water molecule or of the hydrogen and oxygen. The blue is showing lots of variation through time. This is due to air mass trajectory, rain intensity. But look at the red line. It is flat. That's the stream response. What that is saying is that even at the peak of that hydrograph, there is no detectable rainfall making its way into the stream channel. This stream is a flood made up of water that was pushed out of the catchment during that event. And you can see from the photo in the, in the lower right, it's a very narrow in size channel Sure, there's a little bit of rain falling on the stream itself, but it's so small, you can hardly detect it. This is a big challenge. How would you model this? How does this information change the way you view your numerical rainfall runoff model? It's saying something quite profound. You're driving your model with rainfall, but there's no rainfall making up the stream flow on the event time scale. It's rain that fell days, weeks, months, years beforehand. So celerity much greater than velocity. Now there's been a lovely uh, meta-analysis of all the papers that have looked at these kind of ratios of rainfall to old water or what we call pre-event water to event water. This is now published in reviews of geophysics. On the y-axis this is percent of pre-event water. So zero would be all rainfall 100 would be all water that existed in the catchment before the rain started falling. And you can see here that more than half of the studies are showing about 80% or more water that existed in the catchment before the rain appearing in the hydrograph. So this is widespread observation across a multitude of catchments globally. Now, what controls this? Well. It turns out geology has a big effect. And we're gonna ask this question, how does geology affect stream flow? And let's go back to this site in Oregon. This is a, a long-term research site with many uh, nested watersheds. And we're going to sample all of these for isotopes and not only ask how old the water is, but how the age of that water scales across the landscape. And you can see some catchments are very small, maybe. 10 hectares or so, and some are, uh, the big one containing it all is larger at about 60 square kilometers. And what we do now is uh, we sample the input and we look at the output, but we calculate the age by convolving the input with a distribution function you see in the bottom here. This is the residence time distribution. This field has moved very rapidly in recent years and there are more sophisticated approaches now. But what you do is choose one of these functions. Many of you are engineers, you'll recognize them by names, a Dirac function, an exponential function, uh, two parallel linear reservoirs. And what you're doing is convolving the input with one of these functions to give you the best fit on the outflow data. So we sample, for instance, the dots in green, which is the stream flow in one of our sites. And then we do this so-called convolution to get what might be the best fit. In this case, this is our best fit. And the mean of that uh, residence time distribution or transit time distribution is in this case, 2.2 years. So that's the average age, if you like, of the stream. So now we're gonna do this for all of those streams you saw on the map. 
you don't need to know too much about this other than we did the same technique. And on the right hand column, you see the range of ages from uh, just under one year to just over three years. And the question now is, okay, we understand the age range of these waters, how do they scale? We thought initially that it, they would scale where the bigger the watershed, the older the water. So here's the watershed up here on the right on this, uh, on this uh, Google Earth image. I'm gonna show you some other data. So I want to come back to this diagram. Um, so this is where the catchment is that you saw. And here we're plotting, just look at the one on the left first. That's that age, remember from about one to three years. And then on the x-axis here is the area of the watershed. And what you see is really no relationship with basin area. But if we look at that same relationship or that same data with now the median flow path length, meaning the length of the slopes, and if you add in the gradient of the slopes, you get even higher correlation. Now we see some scaling relations, scaling relations that you would never see with runoff data alone. Now we wanna test this hypothesis by going from this very uh, uh, low permeability volcanic environment to over in this region where we have uh, eight or so watersheds like the ones I showed you, but in much more permeable geology. And what did we find? We found the exact opposite. Rather than a strong relationship with the terrain measures, now we are finding a strong relationship uh, with the area. Why is that? Why are things getting older with larger watershed scale uh, in more permeable uh, geology? Well, of course, we need to think about the role of geology. And these rocks, these uh, metamorphic uh, sedimentary kind of rocks, these sandstones, mudstones that are yielding this strong relationship with catchment area mean that the flow paths are rather different. So now rather than things being pushed laterally uh, quickly down slope, you're, as you see in the upper middle diagram, these permeable zones are uh, transiting water much deeper in the system and the ages are greater. So rather than one to three years old, these are more on the order of maybe three to 15 years old, these stream waters. So again, this is the age we think of these stream waters that are draining these steep, wet, responsive uh, catchments. Now, going to Europe, I spent last year in Luxembourg on sabbatical with Laurent Pfister. Here is a set of watersheds, uh, 16 watersheds in Luxembourg. And the, the beauty of Luxembourg as a country, well, there's many reasons for Luxembourg being a lovely place, but one is that they have very different geology sitting next to each other. And these watersheds, the colors represent different rock types from sandstone to marl to schist to other types of rock with highly variable permeability. And what we find when we age date those waters and we look at the mean transit time on the y-axis versus the percent of uh, low permeability rock, let's just say, when we have more permeable rock, the ages get greater. And when we have more low permeable rock, the ages get lower. And the size of the dots represents the flow magnitude in the stream. So again, geology is a strong indicator of not just the damping of the, the tracer, but giving us ultimately some window into what the age of that water might be. And again, think about your numerical model uh, that you're using. Are you thinking of waters in your streams that are some years or decade old? Uh, or are the, are the waters in your hydrograph that day's rainfall or that week's rainfall? Here, if we go deeper, how, uh, how does the age change? We know in Luxembourg, if I go back, that there is a brewery that takes water from the sandstone aquifer. And that brewery water, which uh, is taking from a, an aquifer at about 300 meters depth, so quite deep, we know that that water is 33,000 years old. 
we did a, a meta-analysis of well water. This was led by Scott Giseco, a former postdoc. He's now at UC Santa Barbara. And this looked at 6,500 groundwater wells in Europe, in North America. You kind of see the map at the bottom here. And on the y-axis is depth below the ground surface, zero to 600 meters. So going down admittedly quite deep. And then some of the, the places uh, along the top here. The take home message here, and this was surprising to me as a, a surface water hydrologist, is that by the time you get down about 250 meters, two thirds of the waters pumped from these wells uh, is older than 10,000 years. So what we call fossil groundwater. So 250 meters depth is not that great when you think of steep, wet, mountainous catchments. And so it's saying that our streams are fairly young in the scheme of things, maybe uh, one to 10 years old, but the water in storage can be very old and below 250 meters, two thirds of that water is more than 10,000 years old. How do we deal with that in a hydro, in a water balance that is closed on an annual time scale when the water in the stream and certainly the water below ground is way, way older than the closure at that annual time step. This is a, a kind of a question I want you to ponder in your own research, perhaps. Okay, the other question I want to discuss uh, is how biology affects stream flow. And of course, we talked about things going this way and how groundwater affects it. Now we're gonna talk about the other part of the water balance or the outflow, and that's uh, evapotranspiration. And this, of course, can be a much bigger flux even than stream flow in terms of the water balance of many catchments around the world. And we're going to also use our tracers, the uh, oxygen 18 and deuterium, and we're going to get at questions of, well, where do trees get their water and how old might that water be? And this is a, a, an emerging area. It's been, uh, it was initiated back in the early 90s and really in the last decade, things have really taken off with many papers. And of course, when you look underground, this is a, a slide of a friend of mine in New Zealand, uh, Chris Phillips, uh, you know, uh, the tree root networks, it's a living system below ground that we don't see. And we can sample the, the water in the xylem, that's the transporting part of the, the living tissue in the tree. And we can sample it just like we would sample a stream channel, extract that water and ask questions of, where is the tree getting its water? How old might that water be? And our assumption, of course, is that this subsurface is well mixed and whatever water is not making its way to groundwater recharge, well, then that's fair game for uh, trees to take up that water in the form of transpiration. Now, remember we looked at this diagram where on the left-hand side, we have the precipitation input it's quite sinusoidal. That's because in the, in the winter, our signatures are more negative. In the summer, our signatures are closer to zero. You've uh, probably read about this in paleoclimate reconstructions because the isotopes of hydrogen and oxygen have been used extensively for uh, reconstructions of cold and, and, cold and uh, warmer periods. Biologists use stable isotopes to track uh, migrations of birds or butterflies or fish. We're as hydrologists using these same tools and techniques, but again, here we're looking at a single isotope and its sinusoidal input and how it's damped in the stream. We can also look at this in so-called dual isotope space, meaning rather than just one uh, isotope, we can look at the two together. And this is what such a plot looks like. On the x-axis is oxygen 18, and on the y-axis is uh, 2H or deuterium. We have a name for that isotope. But the two plot uh, linearly, and that's called uh, the meteoric water line. And in my work, in the last 30 years working in small catchments, all of the waters I've sampled have fallen on that line. And they show the same kind of sinusoidal pattern, but now stretched out along that line. 
so that uh, say warm precipitation would be closer to uh, zero and cold, cool weather would be closer to the most negative range. So that would be the precipitation. And just like the previous diagram, the soil water and then the stream flow I'm showing here with a little brown circle is lagged and damped. But now rather than seeing that uh, single isotope sinusoidal variation, we're now seeing it stretched out along that meteoric water line. So this is how most of these data look like as from a hydrological perspective. And any deviations from that line tell us something about hydrological processes, meaning any water that or samples that plot below that line are indications of evaporation and any water that plots above that line is an indication of condensation. Now, the reason that's important is because when we go and look at these data from trees now compared to our stream flow and soil water and groundwater, uh, what we found was that they look quite different. I worked with a colleague of mine, a, a, a plant biologist, uh, and we, this, these were some of the first data we looked at together. Here we have that meteoric water line where all of my samples from the site fell along that line. And she brought these data in green to our uh, coffee meeting we had one day. And these are the, the samples that were extracted from the, the xylem of the tree. And they plotted off in this really weird place for me because I'd never seen waters there. And that's odd because of course the trees must be using some kind of subsurface water, but I'd never seen that water. We realized that she was extracting water from the tree using an extraction technique in a lab, unlike me with a, a in the soil in the in the field using a suction lysimeter and just getting the most mobile water. So we then sampled the soil water using her technique, getting all of the water out of the soil. And this is what we saw. The trees were falling in a spread of soil water that went from shallow, those open dots, progressively down deeper and deeper, down to about a meter or so where those brown dots come back close to the line. This is suggesting that the trees, even in this wet environment, you see a picture of our site there uh, on the, in the upper right in that little photo, these trees are using water that seems to have undergone some evaporative enrichment, we might say. They're using water that we don't see in the stream. And the water we see in the stream that falls on that meteoric water line the trees don't seem to be using. And this, this is something we call eco-hydrological separation. In other words, the blue is where the mobile waters are falling and the brown and green, the brown being the soil water, the green being the trees, they seem to be using two fundamentally separate uh, sources of water, at least based on these data. We were quite hard pressed to explain this. And this was our our best attempt at a conceptual model. And the idea was that this site, even though it's wet, has a, a long dry period. We might call it a wet Mediterranean climate. And at the beginning of the wetting, the, the, the wet season on the left-hand side, the first rains recharge the, the, the more tightly bound soil water that's been uh, extracted by the plants. Then the rains start and for six months, it just rains all the time. But that rain moves through the soil, it seems in a more preferred way, not mixing or displacing that more tightly bound recharged water. And then six months later, when the trees wake up, as it were, and start transpiring, they start transpiring the water that had recharged six months earlier. Now, we were really uh, not so confident in this model or even in these results because they were so uh, so strange, because what it's suggesting is that there are kind of two water worlds there. So the one on the left where the, the stream is a lagged and damped version of the input, like you've seen now in many cases. And the right hand side, it's saying that the plants are a lagged and damped version of the soil water. But those two systems are not really interacting. So we tried to pose that as a null hypothesis to try to reject with uh, global data because this opens up 
what we say in Canada as a can of worms. I'm not sure if there's a direct translation into Russian here, but it's a bit of a problem because this is different to how we usually think about the water balance uh, at this scale. So one of my uh, former PhD students, Habame Ivaristo, who's now an assistant professor at Utrecht in the Netherlands, he did an analysis of the data that we could get in the literature that had the kind of information we needed to test this uh, conceptual thinking, uh, soil water that was extracted with this same kind of technique, uh, plant water, groundwater, and rainfall. And we supplemented this with some data from the International Atomic Energy Agency. And what we find when we plot these data is that not surprisingly, like my catchment data sets, the groundwater and the stream flow are plotting on this so-called global meteoric water line. But when we look at the plants in green and the soils in the bottom right, now things are plotting below the line. The plants seem to be trending with the soil water that is in a separate kind of lower slope angle space than the more mobile water. So this, this has really continued to be a, a vexing question in terms of understanding mechanistically what might be going on. And I could uh, talk for hours on some of the new research by many groups that are going after these questions. Maybe I'll just mention that this kind of behavior has been seen in other ways as well. This was a paper that came out around the same time as the previous paper I just showed using a very different technique. This is satellite information. And this is a satellite uh, that measures the deuterium variation, this isotope of hydrogen in atmospheric vapor. And uh, this was a, a, a very, interesting paper came out in Science by Stephen Good and colleagues. And what they found was something rather similar, that to close their water balance, if you like, using their, their measured from space tracer information, they found that limited connectivity between the soil and surface water fundamentally structures the physical and biogeochemical interactions of water uh, transiting through catchments. So again, things seem compartmentalized in ways that perhaps we've not thought about because we've looked more at simply the hydrometrics, the rainfall runoff behavior. The last thing I wanna mention with respect to plants is this question of how old might that water be? And here we can use uh, other tracers as well. We can use this both in stream water and plant water. Many of you have seen a plot like this this was the peak of uh, thermonuclear bomb testing in 1963. This is um, tritium on the y-axis, and this is a date on the, on the x-axis. And of course, tritium is also an isotope. In fact, it's an isotope of hydrogen, H3, but it is radioactive and has a half-life of just over 12 years. But this is very useful because it's a marker that we can look for to maybe age date waters. Uh, this is actually used for age dating groundwater stream flow. How can we use it to age date plant water? Here we've gone to China, where a very large forest planting exercise has un been undertaken in the China Lus Plateau. They're planting an area the size of France uh, to stabilize uh, a lot of erosion that's happening in these over uh, intensively cultivated zones on these very dispersive loose soils. These are windblown uh, silty materials. And what we're going to do is now look for that uh, bomb peak in the soil. Just look at the right hand plot. On the x axis is tritium, on the y axis is depth. And this is soil depth on the going down to 20 meters. In fact, the soil, if you can call it soil in air quotes, uh, this is actually the loose and it's up to 100 or even 200 meters. So these are unusually deep soils. And what we can do is see that 1963 bomb peak down here at about eight meters. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is that the trees that are being planted, at least in this particular spot, are apple trees. And these apple trees put down roots 
deeper than eight meters. They put down roots all the way through that beautiful profile of soil water tritium concentration. And because of that, we can do a mixing model analysis to see how much tritium is in the apple that we pick. And we can calculate then the age of that water the tree is transpiring. And these trees vary in age. Uh, you're seeing a little cartoon with ages of trees going up to about 20 years. And of course, as they get older, the roots go, the roots go deeper. But the key point here is that we've calculated the age of that apple water. This is the age of the water they're transpiring, and it's on the order of 30 years old, three zero. This I'd say is very different to a calculation of age of the transpired water in our models, which is probably on the order of, uh, you know, hours, days. Now, this is admittedly an uh, extreme example to basically show that we can do this and that there are these ages that exist. And there's much work now being done on the age of transpired water in other places. So let me try to move to wrap up so we have perhaps some time for uh, questions. What I'm really calling for uh, is maybe a, a, a critical look at this terrestrial water cycle. So when we go back to our diagram we started off with, uh, I guess what the data I'm presenting is suggesting from field studies uh, using these isotope tracers, the tracer of the water molecule, is that things seem somewhat compartmentalized and maybe not as uh, smooth flowing and rhythmic as we might think about in a traditional water balance sense. And many of these components can be much, much older than the kind of one year uh, timestamp that we use often to close that water balance. Let me give you an example. We looked at the age of groundwater uh, and we said that below 250 meters, two thirds of the world's groundwater is older than 10,000 years. Here's another analysis Scott has done of global stream flow. And these are showing the sites in red on the map. And what you're seeing is a kind of a frequency distribution then of what we're calling young stream flow. This is a, a term that's meant to describe water that is three months old or less. And what do we see? We see that young stream flow is comprising about one third of global runoff. And that is curious because now we've got this great disparity. We've got a third of global runoff is less than three months and two thirds of global groundwater deeper than 250 meters is older than 10,000 years. This is a real challenge for how we conceptualize that and bring this into our thinking from the perspective of water sustainability. And it's suggesting, these data are suggesting that it's just really in some ways a tiny fraction of this continental aquifer volume that's generating in this case about a third of that water, young, young water. So you got young and old in this kind of uncomfortable mix. And in some ways it's kind of a worst of both worlds scenario when you think of uh, pollution because you've got a significant amount of very young uh, runoff that might be say uh, nitrate uh, loaded overland flow from farm fields. And then you've got extremely old uh, water maybe moving into the channel from groundwater that could take a long, long, long time for persistent chemicals to move through the system. So we, we need new theory to uh, deal with this. This is a lovely paper that came out uh, a couple of years ago by Wouter Berghaus and Jim Kirshner at ETH Zurich. And they talked about this uh, relationship between contrasting ages of groundwater and stream flow. And they made the, the, uh, the kind of theoretical assumption that maybe it has to do with the permeability of the shallow and deep uh, aquifer or, or uh, hydrogeological systems. So that if you look at a, a, a plot on the right, which is the ratio of aquifer conductivities, the shallow and the deep, 
And if you look at the ratio of residence time to transit time, that means the age of water in the system to the age of water flowing out of the system, you might see this kind of uh, uh, <coughs> U-shaped uh, behavior. We need to be testing this. And indeed, uh, several papers are now testing this, this theory. But what we really need, I think, is to get at what I'm calling here the demographics of the water balance. What is the population distribution age-wise of our different waters? This is a lovely review paper that just came out in reviews of geophysics by Matthias Springer. And what you see is kind of a, a distribution of various waters from surface water to vegetation water to atmospheric water, groundwater. And I think this is our, the future. It's coming up with perhaps an age-based version of the water balance that gets at the age of those characteristic components of the water balance because that is going to really illuminate and uh, I think reveal a lot in terms of our ability to model uh, change in our systems. And this was this is kind of a, a, a diagram from that paper, which I commend to you, that starts to think about what those distributions might be for these different waters in the water balance. The last thing I'll say is that these tracers can be very helpful for evaluating our models. This is a little paper Keith Bevin and I had a couple of years ago in water resources research, just talking about how as a community, we really need to get to grips with these velocities, celerities, and residence time uh, distributions if we're going to get our answers for the right reasons. And you know, many of you are, are modelers. Uh, this might kind of whet your appetite in the sense that we could have four models going from model one being very simple to model four being slightly more complex. And what we often find is that our models can do very well for one evaluation criterion like uh, Nash Sutcliffe efficiency over there on the Y on the Y axis on the uh, model number one. So that's simply you know getting the fit of the hydrograph right. But if we add other evaluation criteria like the mean residence time of the soil water or the stream flow, now you can begin to evaluate the model and perhaps understand models that are working uh, maybe a little less right, but for the right process reasons. And that would be the, those red dots in the upper right-hand corner, perhaps, where you're getting now a good fit for the things you care about and, and have measured with tracers and also the, the stream flow that we've measured as well. The last example I'll give is a paper that just came out in hydrological processes by a group from Indiana looking at the consequences in numerical models of assuming the single kind of uh, water world or the two water worlds, this eco-hydrological separation that I mentioned earlier. And there are big consequences of this in terms of uh, stores and fluxes of water at the catchment scale. But this is very new work. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to kind of start to bring in this increasing amount of tracer data that is tracing the water cycle, but giving us insight into rather different piece of the water cycle than we often think about. Okay, so let me just wrap up here with a couple of conclusions uh, slides. I guess what I'm trying to have you uh, take away is that uh, in this case, uh, celerity is greater than velocity. If we've learned anything in catchment hydrology uh, process studies in the last 50 years, it's this. And that the subsurface is not just poorly mixed, it's acutely non-well mixed. And there is, I think, widespread support for this kind of eco-hydrological separation. But I admit that a lot of the plant physiological mechanisms are still being worked out. But I think increasingly there's evidence of this compartmentalization of the water cycle this water cycle that uh, Pierre Perrault helped give us, uh, in a, at least in terms of measurements back in 1674. And maybe just to end with a quote from the, uh, from the hero of our story, as it were, it is to experiments that we owe the finest knowledge we now have concerning the things of nature. So I just, a plug for field work, for data collection, 
to help understand how our systems work. And then a last conclusion slide, just to say that maybe the future is going after perhaps more general questions. How does geology and biology control what we see in the stream? How can chemistry help answer these questions? Uh, I just gave one tiny example with isotopes, but of course, uh, a full suite of chemistry can give much, much more information still. How and when are these compartments uh, connected? And then maybe this might help to remove some of the, the artificial boundaries between the subdisciplines that many of us are working in, uh, hydrology, soil science, uh, and so on. So Alexander and Dimitri, I'll, I'll leave it there. And uh, if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to, to answer them. Professor McDonald, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. And with this uh, uh, integrating thoughts uh, in the end, that uh, perhaps we should be looking more at integrating different sciences in water management and water studies in general. Thank yeah. you very much. We move now to questions. So we have a number of them. Let me see. Yes, so first question comes from Dr. Pelagie Belikova from Water, <coughs> sorry, Institute for Water Problems of Russian Academy of Sciences. Is the concept of old water confirmed in the storm events which occur in arid regions? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, there have been some very nice studies done in Arizona by Peter Trock. Some of you might know T-R-O-C-H and some of his students. And he is showing uh, uh, examples where old water can persist, but you're right in many areas, even in Canada as well, where there is overland flow, then it's going to be more event water. So for instance, uh, perhaps like Siberia, in Saskatchewan, we have snowmelt on frozen ground. And when we have snowmelt on frozen ground, particularly if the ground freezes wet in the fall, we get overland flow and the water going into our streams is dominated by new water. It could be all new water. Similarly, if you have a, a intense rainfall event in the Negev Desert and it's all overland flow driven, yes, you will see uh, more new water. But there are examples as well where uh, older water persists and you can see some of those studies by Peter Trock. Yeah. Thank you very much. So next question is from Ludmila Lebedeva. Hello, Luda, uh, from Russia. <clears throat> Many traces studies are done in relatively small headwater catchments. Are the methods and terms applicable to large basins? Yeah, very, very good question. Um, it's, it, in some ways it's more challenging, in some ways it's easier. Uh, meaning uh, uh, Stefan Ullenbrock, who was at Freiburg University and then at IHE, uh, I think he's now with uh, EMI, is that right? In, uh, yes. uh, in uh, Sri Lanka. He, he had done some very nice work with some of his students in I believe the Brugge Basin in, in Germany, where they looked at many hundreds of square kilometers, perhaps up to a thousand square kilometers, and did these kind of hydrograph separation studies. Um, isotopes have recently been brought into uh, regional rainfall runoff models. I'm trying to think of the one, um, there's a group in Illinois who've just incorporated one for a study that covered a chunk of the Northwest United States. And as you go bigger, it's helpful in the sense that you see patterns spatially in the rainfall or precipitation, meaning there's a latitude effect, there's an altitude effect, and you see patterns stretching out over your large watershed. And you can embrace those patterns that are more heterogeneous at the headwater scale. But I would agree that at that large scale, it's still in its infancy and uh, uh, much more needs to be done. Certainly, uh, you know, there are isotope enabled uh, models like ECHAM, uh, kind of regional climate models, but uh, only a couple I've seen in terms of regional rainfall runoff models 
have uh, have have been isotope enabled. Um, Charlie Voris Marty and one of his colleagues uh, some years ago had a regional climate model that was isotope enabled and uh, for the northeast United States. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor McDonald. We move to the next question. And this is from Dr. Moreido, also from Institute for Water Problems. How does preferential flow affect the water age in the stream? Yeah, good question. Uh, that was the, my PhD thesis in 1990, uh, was that exact question. There had been some work in a small headwater catchment in New Zealand. The, the early work by Paul Mosley had suggested that the very rapid storm hydrographs, and when I say rapid, I mean probably the most responsive headwater storm hydrographs ever recorded in the literature, and that's still the case. These are steep forested systems where there is no overland flow except on the stream channel. And he found that these preferential flow paths that not only go vertically but laterally were responsible for generating these very flashy hydrographs. Hydrographs where the falling limb was the same rate as the rising limb, so almost like an overland flow on a parking lot. The work that followed by uh, other colleagues used stable isotopes and they found that most of the water looked like water that had been in the catchment for some months or years. And they rejected the whole concept of preferential flow because surely if it was preferential flow, it'd look like rainwater. So my thesis was to try to uh, come to grips with that. And there was a, a series of papers in water resources research. You can find them on my webpage uh, in the early 90s that tried to understand how that happens. And it seems that even with preferential flow, it's almost like the trigger to liberate old water. So preferential flow to depth can trigger transient saturation. And then that is a released laterally down slope in that kind of uh, pressure wave hose analogy that I gave. And there's much more water typically stored in that soil profile than added by the rainfall. So there's kind of a, a dilution effect that's occurring along the way. But I'd, I'd refer you to some of those and more recent papers you can perhaps find on my webpage on that topic. Thank you very much, Professor McDonald. By the way, I forgot to ask you kindly to uh, stop sharing the slides yeah. and then everybody can see you better. Yeah. Let me just uh, make one- uh, Unless you thing. need it. I'm, I just want to show one thing. This is oh, shameless, yes, yes. shameless self-promotion here. This, I know, I know it's uh, PhD students and postdocs. And this is a, a small book that came out earlier this year talking about not hydrology, but how to navigate or launch your academic career. It's published by AGU and John Wiley and Sons. Uh, it's been translated into Chinese, but not Russian yet. If there's anyone that's interested, please send me an email and I could send you a copy and we can talk. But I, I do, because of uh, this, this focus on mentoring that I, I have more generally, I just wanted to make some of your early career folks uh, perhaps aware of this uh, little publication. And again, you can find this on my webpage. All right, so that's my- We have ordered this book, uh, that's very nice. And I'm sure this uh, boat, which is on the cover, is floating on the new, very fresh water. <laughs> that's right. That's we right. move to the next question, meanwhile. <clears throat> uh, yes, it is uh, from uh, Dr. Mark Ehrlich from France, uh, where your hero is originating, right? <laughs> 400 years ago. I have many, many uh, Mark, French heroes, yeah. Yes, Mark is originally Polish, uh, but uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> so uh, your conclusions, Mark uh, asks the question. Your conclusion suggests the finite volume method is more appropriate for catchment water cycle studies in comparison with um, finite volume, finite element method or compartmental modeling. Uh, was I good uh, reproducing this question, I wonder? Let, let, is it clear or I should repeat? Um, 
I'm not sure I fully understand. Uh, you're wondering yeah. if my conclusions are consistent with say a finite element model versus a more conceptual reservoir model? Is that? Yes, uh, yeah. uh, yes, yes. So conclusions suggest that finite volume method is more appropriate for catchment water st cycle studies if compared to uh, finite element method or compartmental modeling. Yeah, I'm not sure I can fully answer that. I, I don't think I'm suggesting that there's a, one preferred method over another. It's just that we need to take account of the velocity of the water molecule, whether we do that in a finite element or finite difference model, or we do it in a, uh, a bucket or reservoir based uh, conceptual rainfall runoff model. Uh, both are, are possible and I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to uh, advocate any particular modeling uh, tool or approach, except to realize that there are these different timescales of response and we should perhaps think about our models being able to capture both of them. There was a, a lovely paper in Science uh, two years ago by Reed Maxwell, and this was a, a, a very impressive paper modeling at the continental United States scale, uh, groundwater and transpiration using PAR flow. PAR flow is a Darcy Richard solver, and it was really a, a technological achievement to run this at the continental scale. And there they were getting at uh, characteristic ages of water uh, in the groundwater and taking into account some of the things I've been talking about. Uh, also, there have been more uh, conceptual rainfall runoff models trying to preserve the tracer signal as well. Uh, so I guess I'm, I'm a bit agnostic as to, you know, which type of model approach you might take, as long as you can try to acknowledge those different speeds. Right, thank you very much. Uh, um, Professor Gelfan, uh, director of the uh, Institute for Water Problems is asking, how can you explain workability in any sense of hydrological models that do not consider the old water mechanism of runoff generation? Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying to get rid of those models because we need, you know, many models for many purposes. And it's, uh, as I'm sure has been discussed through the school, fit for purpose is, uh, you know, so key to this. Um, and, you know, many models don't need to include that if you're, you know, looking at peak flows for a designing a culvert or a bridge, you may not need uh, that. But if you're starting to think about maybe changing precipitation from, say, snow to rainfall or uh, unidirectional shifts in the distribution of your inputs and how that will express itself on different time scales in your stream, or perhaps you're interested in nitrate that's been applied on agricultural areas and how that nitrate, how long it will take to get to the stream channel, which could be many decades uh, or even centuries for a part of the plume to show up in addition to the flashy hydrograph. Yeah, then you might want to include some of the things I've been alluding to. So I'm not, I'm not uh, saying we dispense with a, a lot of what we do in engineering that's so important, but for some of the I don't know, more complex environmental problems where you need to understand uh, maybe the length of time certain things take to express themselves in surface water, then I think this can be a helpful uh, way to, to think about those things. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tatiana Gubareva is asking, is the concept of water mixing adequate for the catchment? Well, uh, I guess it's um, in many ways, highly, highly simplistic. And where the new modeling approaches are going is much more sophisticated. So uh, particle tracking models are becoming uh, very, very uh, useful and popular. Um, other models that are able to sort of, uh, yeah, get at the age selection of stream flow at different flow rates what we're realizing is that, that that transit time distribution that I talked about in the older kind of uh, approach to age dating stream flow 
that's assuming that the, the catchment has a kind of a single transit time distribution. And what studies have shown in the last five or 10 years is that that distribution is changing through the year. The, the, the kind of system that a raindrop finds when it lands on a catchment in the summer versus the winter or the fall or the spring can be very, very different. So this time varying transit time distribution is really a, a popular thing now in many of these uh, more sophisticated models. And I think going to this question by Tatiana, uh, what I presented was really a, the most simplistic view. And a lot of the modeling now is, is getting into some of these complexities using particle uh, tracking models and other formulations. Thank you very much. And uh, the question from Kristina Shahirina. Can something affect the results of water age estimation, type of precipitation, for example? Maybe you can name some causes of errors. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there can be many, many errors uh, in terms of, well, the, the groundwater study I made reference to led by Scott Giusecco that looked at these uh, groundwater ages for the 6,500 wells. One additional finding was that for, I think it was half of those deep wells that showed fossil water, water older than 10,000 years, half of those also saw modern water based on the tritium concentration, meaning post-bomb water, water uh, younger than say 1960. And that's a potential error. And it, it could be due to poor well casing. So maybe some, you know, some water got down the, the outside of, of the well casing and kind of contaminated the deep groundwater. So even though the groundwater is mostly fossil water, maybe some very modern water got down due to the issues with well installation. That's just one of, you know, potentially many types of errors that, or issues that can creep into this. Um, luckily, we have the International Atomic Energy Agency <coughs> who have a <coughs> isotope network in precipitation. And they have about 500 stations globally. And now they are mounting uh, an effort like that, uh, which is called GNIP. Now there's a GNIR, global network of isotopes and rivers. And this is going to be very helpful in the years and decades ahead, where we'll have both the input with the many hundreds of rainfall or precipitation stages, and then another network of rivers. And these are also at larger scales. So going back to one of the early questions about catchment scale, this should really help us with uh, better data at those larger scales. Professor McDonald, thank you very much. We exhausted the, the list of questions. We also uh, approached the end of uh, this uh, day. Uh, I would like on behalf of all participants and of the co-chair of this school, Professor Gelfan, to thank you very much. Well, wow. thank you. Thank you very much for uh, finding time to do this lecture at such an early uh, hour in Saskatchewan. <laughs> Also, your colleague, Professor Pomeroy, was doing this yesterday. Excellent. But you are doing this even earlier. So thanks a lot. And My we pleasure. hope uh, that uh, there would be a day when we all get together and meet each other face to face and uh, would also try some beverages or liquids, uh, which are also very old as the waters <laughs> you're studying. OK, thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. And the audience and everybody, please come tomorrow for the last but not least day of our lecture. Tomorrow okay. we start uh, at, please note, at 1.45, so 13.45 Moscow time. It's 12.45 Central European summer time with the Professor uh, Vaskian Andreasian, followed by Professor Yukiki Hirabashi, and then Professor Muru, Murugesu Siva Palan who will be last speaker of that school tomorrow, Friday. Great. Thank you very much okay. and good luck. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye. <laughs>